You know, before the show starts, the murmur of the crowd, that's intoxicating. I love to get up there on stage, and, and when it works, it's better than anything. It's better than sex, better than drugs, better than family. It's better than chocolate fudge. It's, it's, ah. Please welcome to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, with a warm San Francisco round of applause, Mr. Will Dirt. We've got the invisible airplane, the stealth plane. What good is an invisible airplane going to do? Enemy looked down at the radar and say, well, there's no aircraft here, but there's this little guy in a sitting position at 40,000 feet. <laughs> nah. the vaporousness, is that a word, of stand-up. I love how every set is just sort of vapor. The people in the room see it, you perform it, and then it's over and you go away and that was it. I got hung over on Cinco de Mayo. You do that, man? Oh, what a party. Leave it to the Mexicans to have a holiday celebrating mayonnaise. You know, those people get out there and they just do it. Hey man, quattro de mustard, right on, man. <laughs> Celebrate all the condiments, man. Yeah. That's been very nice. Take care. Do I can introduce you as Larry Bubbles Brown? Is that the appropriate way? Yeah, most of my humor is about me, so I have to find new ways to become a loser. When I was 14, Dad sat me down and told me about women. He said, Larry, someday you're going to meet a woman that's so perfect and so right and so wonderful that you're not even going to haggle over price. <laughs> God, it's good to be home. I'm not lying. How many people here feel that being able to vomit on command is a masculine concept? Sure, man. Come back to San Francisco, the first thing I hear, San Francisco women are always whining. All the men in this town are gay or look like you. <laughs> Never get in a fight with an ugly person, he has nothing to lose. Definitely look like guys with a with a big future. There you go. <laughs> I have a brother who is developmentally disabled. He didn't have the facility of speech, but he could understand humor. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad and I would make him laugh. Making people laugh was something that not everybody could do, and it was something that I could do. We 
weird thing about trying to do stand-up comedy in Milwaukee is comedy is illegal in the city environs of Milwaukee. We actually had a showcase busted. And the Tavern Squad came in, turned on all the lights, um, all right, up against the wall, drop your props. Step away from the microphone. You could tell stories, but if they have a joke at the end, that's comedy. Was that a premise? Walk away. That was another thing that spurred me. Westward young man. San Francisco was a left bank of comedy in the 80s. Kindred spirits everywhere. Kind of like a cradle of civilization for comedy, I think, San Francisco is. It's so tiny, and yet a lot has happened through the years in, in this one place. The generation before us, Mort Saul, and the Smothers Brothers, and Phyllis Diller. San Francisco has always nurtured the arts. It's always been a really cool town. Who knew Lenny Bruce was gonna be as big as he was? Who knew he was gonna become an icon? And it happened here in San Francisco. Who knew that the people from Happy Days would see Robin Williams in a club and go, and come on down for an audition and, you know, boom. And he was the first overnight success. Is my lipstick on? <laughs> Felt like you could try anything. And the comics here were taking chances and, and were like verbal jazz artists. Jack Nicholson is swearing so much that even he doesn't understand the words that he's using. I'm gonna cream crack your frabble up your gravel strack, can you crockle mac? It seemed like magic to me. Like we're in a club and it's all magic, you know? With all these unknown people trying to make it. Comedians were coming out of the woodwork because everybody was going to be a star. Paula Poundstone moved from Boston. Bobcat Goldthwait, Whoopi Goldberg. Bill DeGeneres. Rob Schneider. Bobby Slayton. All these guys. <laughs> and more, and tons more. Let's get more. It was just electric to walk into the clubs. It was such a big boom. And then the first week I got to San Francisco, I was on stage eight times. It was, ah. San Francisco, the only town in the world where guys in motorcycle leathers trade recipes. <laughs> and I quit my little day job, and I never looked back. First joke I think I remember was my dad had, would go to these mom and pop stores and he had a guy whose name was Sal Cologne. And I just thought that was funny because it was, I didn't know from the city of Cologne or anything, I just knew Cologne was. And so I said, who's his brother, Joe Aftershave? And I remember everybody broke up. I went to graduate school at San Diego State and I saw that there was an open mic on campus. And I went up. And I'm sure every joke didn't work, but I knew that night, I knew before I left the room that I was leaving graduate school. I knew I was quitting and coming home where San Francisco was already starting to become the place. I remember one time thinking that when I saw some of those guys on stage, that what they were doing was like physics. And I was, I was going to the audience, two plus two equals four, huh? Huh, this is great. Whenever there was a gig, anybody, there's a gig, I, there's a new gig, where's the gig? There was a gig, some guy was opening a basement club in Modesto. I remember just like three cars of guys with four guys each in a car cruising out there. Downtown Modesto. And I remember vividly, something clicked. And don't cut corners is with the condoms because uh, I look at it this way. Uh, she's sleeping with me. She's not a good decision maker. Do you see that? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. What kind do you want, sir? I want those, top shelf, right there. The 19 milliliter thick Doughboy swimming pool liner condoms, right there. With the herbicides and pesticides. When I rip it open, I want the Orkin man to come stepping out with a spray pack. How do you like that? And I had a great set. And after this guy comes over and says, uh, hey, my name is Paul Messier, and I'm with the Improvs. Get your calendar out. And two weeks from now, you're opening for Dennis Miller in Las Vegas. And after that, you're going to Chicago. Or you're... I'm like, what? What? Who? What? Uh, 
I think uh, first grade I was at recess and I was watching clouds go by and for some reason that ticked off my brain that we're all going to die one day. So I, I got so depressed I was lying on the asphalt and I couldn't move and they had to bring the teacher out and bring me in. I think there was a note to the parents, I had to see the nurse and uh, but yeah I just I realized the life was very sad so I tried to make it at least funny while we're here. I had my day job. It was for the public health service. And I remember I'd get my work done early and I'd go around to different offices telling people jokes. Half the people thought I was funny and half thought I was just out of my mind. It took me a year to get enough courage to do an open mic. Try to get on at the punchline for a few years. It was a little tougher to get on. Somebody said, you don't want to go there your first time. Go to the Holy City Zoo. So that's, uh, that's when I did. Holy City Zoo was like your uncle's converted garage. And you could go to the zoo and say, I got new material I want to try out, and nowhere else is going to let you do that. I'll talk, I'll talk, take the album off, I'll talk. It's kind of womb-like, it's small. Because it was all made of wood and kind of decorated in early uh, chainsaw. I think our legal capacity was 47. And here's good news. The post office has come up with a plan to continue <laughs> delivering the mail even after a nuclear war. <laughs> Isn't that comforting? <laughs> Civilization's dead. You're fighting with dogs for food, but you still have a chance to win the publisher's clearinghouse. We've stayed. <laughs> These other places were clubs that we worked, but we didn't really hang there. The zoo was where everybody came. It was the neighborhood club and the hangout place. March 3rd, 81, it was a Tuesday. You're just blinded by the lights. First, I thought my voice had frozen up. And finally, the first joke came out. Nice looking crowd, just watching you before I came up. You're all drinking, laughing, having a good time. I thought, gee, too bad they're all gonna get old and die, <laughs> in my mind. I've been kind of depressed lately. I know I mask it well, but uh, I'm getting old. I turned 26 a couple months ago. <laughs> I'm making little observations about life as I head in my twilight years. Like, if you don't get laid a lot when you're young, you don't get laid a lot when you're old. And uh, figured that out by myself and uh, bitter, oh, a tad. But uh, the first few times I was on stage, I did really well. I remember like the eighth time I bombed. I just wanted to quit then. Michael Pritchard came up to me and said, he said, you just bombed. He said, uh, you're in the Holy City Zoo. There's 40 people in there, <laughs> he said, outside of this club, nobody knows. You kill, you bomb, nobody cares. Even when you're feeling that people are supportive, like, nice try. You know, the people are going, oh, that missed, but well done, you know. You almost made it, you know. You missed the net, but God, what a great thing. My very first set in San Francisco after I came home, I was scared to death. Robin Williams popped in right before I went on stage. So he would just show up and go, is there a chance I can go on tonight? And jeer, yeah. The word would go out on Clement Street and people would flock into the zoo. Robin's here, Robin's here. And uh, the place would be packed, dead packed. All the animals that James wants kicked out of every national forest. Now he's sold all the national forests. It's so sad seeing moose and squirrels in the highway. Going north? <laughs> we had audiences at the Holy City Zoo because of him. They would come to see him. And more times than not, they would see him because he was such a, a performing whore. He'd performing every night. And he'd be coming and he'd do like an hour and an hour, a monster hour. And then whoever would stay after, we'd have a little bit of an audience we could perform for. The Holy City Zoo had great open mic nights back then. And it must have been after one of those nights, probably. We'd finished telling our jokes, and it was Becky and I and Larry, and I, we were trying to decide what to do, if we should call in a night or if we should go do something. And I said, you know, what are you, oh, I don't know, you want to go to the hot tubs, maybe? I think for Larry, it was an entirely new idea. It was like <laughs> someone had flipped a switch. He was like, the hot tub, that could be good. We could go to the hot tubs, maybe. And, you know, and for Larry to show excitement about anything is sort of rarity anyway, so you know what I mean? He's like, ooh, the hot tubs could be good. And then we sort of, I, we, we sort of flipped by it, you know, it was a page in a catalog. We were sort of past it. After a little while, it was like this buzzing noise on the side of our heads, you know, there's a hot tubs, hot tubs. And this is so funny. I turned and I said, look, Bubbles, <laughs> I don't think we're going to go to the hot tubs tonight. He became Larry Bubbles Brown from that point forward. 
kind of annoying name, but I could never get rid of it. You had to be a little cooler about the hot tubs than that if you were gonna go. You know, he was just, he would have gotten naked before we got out of the car. And I don't think that's appropriate. I just don't. My name is uh, Larry Bubbles Brown. Pretty ridiculous, grown man, name's Bubbles. I think it should be something more appropriate, like well-equipped sex machine. <laughs> Wouldn't fit on the marquee. You're getting up in front of a bunch of people. Why not, uh, you better talk about yourself and be, try to be interesting, I think, because uh, you don't want to bore them. Right? Ever feel like you've been alive forever? <laughs> Fall is in the air, and like you, I think my thoughts turn to death. It's been a great day for me, haven't passed any blood. When he first started, it was more about we're all gonna die, and there's no good news in the world and everything. Then the hooker joke started. <laughs> Of course I pay for sex. It's what distinguishes me from the animals. <laughs> One of my favorite Larry's lines is, said the sexiest thing a woman's ever said to him is, are you sure you're not a cop? And I just remember the moment he said that, I went, I'm in. Self-deprecation to the point of self-destruction. You know, he's emotionally setting himself on fire a lot of the time. So it's like, I just went, wow. I've, I've hit my 30s, and, uh, which is really depressing, but... Uh... I feel at least a little more mature. I'm not embarrassed anymore to go out in the drugstore and buy a condom. <laughs> Although the woman at the counter said, save your money and buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> Slightly better odds. The San Francisco International Stand-Up Comedy Competition was this pot boiler of putting 40 comedians together who they could win at the height of its popularity, $10,000. You knew that that was a thing that could launch you. Certainly the finalists, but even the semi-finalists had gone on to development deals and TV shows. We're going to be having five finalists this evening. Please welcome to the stage, ladies and gentlemen, with a warm San Francisco round of applause, Mr. Will Durst. You know what scared me about Reagan being shot? He didn't know he was shot. <laughs> Think about that. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd like a president with a central nervous system. <laughs> they did, you know, fourth runner-up, third runner-up, second runner-up, and then there's two left. In second place overall. Mr. And the guy who was uh, the first runner up, and as he says to me as we're standing there, you know, waiting for one of us to be announced as the winner, he says, I hope it's you. And uh, I said, uh, I cannot say the same thing because <laughs> I wanted to win. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the 1983 comedy competition winner, Mr. Will Durst. <laughs> it was a big blur. I remember partying that night until it was light out. It's upward momentum. Yes, it's shooting up. A guy one time said, I work at Pixar and it's great because we have like um, ping pong tables and like cereal machines. I'm a comic. We had uh, cocaine, free booze, and waitresses in miniskirts. What are you, eight years old, for heaven's sake? What do you mean if you had Cheerios? Are you nuts? I was hitting my stride with an act that was political and sort of critical of America. Saddam Hussein was an evil, lecherous... You know what he did? He went into another country where people already lived and took it over for his own, and if anybody dared dissent, he just killed them. Gee, we know this because... Well, that's how we got our country. But the point is this, really. <laughs> All of a sudden, it was like, wow, I can make a living at this, and I can be in a position where I am to be seen by people who can make you wildly famous and rich and successful. I do a benefit in prison. I do a benefit in prison, San Quentin prison. Please welcome to San Quentin prison, Johnny Steele. 
I come out, hey, how you guys doing, man? You know, and they're giving me this, you know, this kind of right. Hey, whatever, you know, my friend said you guys would be like that. You'd be mean and you wouldn't like me, but I figure so what? So what if you don't like me? So what if you think I suck? Who cares? Clearly it wouldn't be the first stupid decision you've made in the last few years, now would it? <laughs> You could do three, four, five sets in a night, and people recognized you on the street as a young comic. The boom had started, then people started making money. It was an amazing scene. <laughs> and babes love me. He's like, oh, I'm gonna take you home and butter your biscuit. I don't know what you're saying. That's some crazy saying. So I was smooth back in those days. You had all these different creative juices. It was heaven. We were little rock stars in this town. We were like celebrities. This is ridiculous. We sold arms to Iran, gave military intelligence to both Iran and Iraq. Now, how did that work? Here, put this gun in your pocket. He's got a gun in his pocket. He knows about the gun, man. <laughs> and we got paid from both of them. Yeah. <laughs> San Francisco has always treated stand-up comedy as an art form. It's the only city in the country, not New York, not L.A. It's a commercial product in New York and L.A. I signed with the biggest, one of the biggest talent agencies in Los Angeles. Suddenly I've got a manager and an agent. You gotta go for an audition for, you know, fast food commercial. You talk about your edgy and your irreverent and all that. They're looking, they're going like this. Does this guy got energy? Does he got some power? Does he got some energy? Is he strong? Is there, you know, where would we use him? What would we do with him? We get this thing where a dog talks. I wanted to be a comic. Well, I first got the call about Letterman, which uh, is very exciting. It was like a really big deal. My first time on TV. I was having nightmares before I flew out there, thinking, what if I bomb? I'm in my hotel Monday night. I'm like two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock. I can't fall asleep. I'm wired. Noon, and I can't fall asleep. I go over there. I got dark rings under my eyes. I was in the green room when I was practicing with my friend, and I kept getting two minutes in my set, and I was drawing blanks. Drawing a blank would be worse than bombing, maybe. If you're just halfway through your set and go, huh, sure, I don't know. Then the assistant comes down and says, you're going to be on next. Then you feel like you're at an execution. And you check your zipper 15 times, make sure it's up. Then somebody ran long. So they said, you're, you're cut. And uh, I came back a month later and did it. Maybe I am 34, but I can do some things now that I couldn't do when I was 17. Like pick up high school girls. <laughs> A lot of people think you need drugs to score on a date. Uh, I've always found chloroform and ether to be pretty effective. Uh, you guys have been a lot of fun, thanks. Nice job. I remember everybody kept saying, this is gonna go on forever, and I kept saying, it's gonna end. Of course, I was right. I was working in London when the improv closed. It was just like, oh man, what? Really? Everything kind of went boom and collapsed, a bit like a comedic recession. The TV, cable, television probably killed stand up uh, for the clubs quite a bit. You didn't have to leave your house, and that destroyed it. And then the clubs got 
they got bought up either closed or got bought up by one just one entity and it became harder to get booked in the clubs this club closed and that club closed we bought the zoo because uh, we couldn't let it die it was our little inner sanctum is where we got away from the business and you could still do the craft. It was a clubhouse that comedians called home. It's no matter who you were or where you came from, if you were a comedian, it's like, come on in, come on. This is the zoo, this is where we hang out. And everybody loved hanging out, but you know, comedians wanted to keep it open. Comedians don't have money. The practicality and the economics were just, you know, if you could pay with your heart, then we would be open still. The last show that we had was a marathon. I think we were there all night. Like I remember being there three or four o'clock in the morning, people hanging out. I thought, oh my God, this really is ending. This is not very manly, but I remember that I went into the bathroom and I actually started crying. Durst did the last set that night. There's nothing like it, and it'll never be again like that. This was outside the club, on the wall there. <laughs> I feel like having a beer now. Ah, there's Bubs. Early shadow Bubs. Yeah. This is when uh, Larry Bubbles Brown was young and uh, beautiful. At this point, I'm qualified to be a crash test dummy or a greeter at Walmart. I go to bed at 3, I get up at 11, then I jog five miles, then I get in the car and leave the city because it's too cold and windy for me. And I usually go to the East Bay and I'll, I'll uh, kill the day doing crossword puzzles, write, try to write some material. I have to have good light. Well, I used to write in car dealerships. They all closed, big recession of 08, 09, so now I'm reduced to going to gas stations and supermarket parking lots. My best jokes will come to me out of the blue. I'll just think of something. When I sit down to consciously write something, you do come up with stuff, but it's never, never as good. No, it's like a crossword puzzle. When you can't get the answers, it becomes kind of frustrating. I'll try out some jokes on you. I asked a woman if she ever fake an orgasm. She said, with you, I'd fake my own death. <laughs> Don't you hate it when you go to the Antiques Roadshow with something your grandmother left you and it turns out to be an Amish dildo? <laughs> it's worthless and you've been humiliated. <laughs> We're killing here in the parking lot. I don't know exactly what my dream was, but I can tell you this, it's harder to achieve now, and it's been, you know, we've all been downsized a little. We're not the, corporate people aren't the only ones that have been downsized. We've been downsized too. The clubs are corporate owned now. The comics who are headlining the clubs are from TV shows and I'll do 30 minutes, and that other guy will do 40 or 45 minutes, maybe more. Um, last time through, uh, maybe just for a few nights, I made a few hundred bucks. The other guy made 25,000.
It's like the rest of America. You either become really famous, like uh, Dave Attell or Louis Black, and you make a lot of money, or you just work in the clubs, you're making very little money. So a huge gap. I'm throwing my fingernails extra long just so I can hang on to the edge right there and not slip off. I'm on my way to uh, perform for people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s. And almost everything you've ever learned in a comedy club is useless here. It's as far from showbiz and where I thought I'd be at this point in my career than one could possibly imagine. But the people are really nice and they really appreciate it. It's just, uh, you know, kind of sometimes you wonder, what am I doing here? All the time I wonder that, I think. This is what, that part of the gig where you look over the audience and then you look at your notes and you go, nope, no, 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 probably not, no. Thank you very much, Barbara. As you may notice, there's some cameras in here and we're trying something new that uh, we're shooting a pornography film in here tonight, if you like that. <laughs> My wife and I uh, found out a while back that we, uh, we can't have children, we won't be able to have children. And for us, honestly, it's not a, a, a medical thing, we just hate the little bastards. And uh, <laughs> from birth to high school graduation, $270,000 per child. $270,000, national average, absolutely. Well, you know, it doesn't, you know, it's not, not that much when you think about it per 17 or 18 years, 270 per child. I checked with my copay at my health care provider, a vasectomy is 15 bucks. <laughs> Anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, I can go on all night, but apparently there's a big bridge tournament, and we don't, really, we don't have a home court advantage yet, so thank you very much for your time. Thanks. I have no idea why I keep going on, or how I keep going on. I just keep going on. Will's talented, he's brilliant. He's a real polished, great act. He plays to the audience like they're the smartest people on the planet. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> the Bay Area's own Mr. Will, Will Durst. Durst. My name is Will Durst. I'm a political comic, which of course, thank you. How sweet of you. Sometimes there's nothing going on and I'm screwed, but not now. The people, they don't know I do politics. Kids just stare at me like, why is this bitter old man lecturing me? The complexity is of supply side economics. The deal is we give the money to the rich and then they spend it and it trickles down to the poor. No, they're not gonna spend it. They're gonna hang on to it. That's how they got rich <laughs> you give us poor money i guarantee we will blow every damn penny we get our grubby little hands on you can learn how to make bad audiences laugh and you can cheapen your your image your material the way to get laughs is to spend most of your act talking about human fluids <laughs> if you talk about that I gotta get out of the clubs. So you now have got a new generation of people growing up with comedy, but they wanted always that sort of formula of late 20s, early 30s, attractive person, cookie cutter, generic stuff, material look, feel, very television friendly, as opposed to really smart, cutting edge, different. In the old days, I would do a gig, pick up the phone, take a gig, that was it. Let's stop with the stand-up. Because I said, stand-up oh, for sure. you is dead, basically. Sure. Stand up's dead to you, okay, but Johnny's really good. What can he do with it? I mean, what about the tools that he uses when he does that? His mind, his fearlessness, are you going, why, is that dead too? I've been trying to lose 10 pounds for 10 years. <laughs> That's kind of sad. It's a pound a year, for Christ's sake. How can you not lose a pound a year? You barely have to change your damn lifestyle, you know? Instead of getting out of bed and walking to the shower, all you have to do is just do this on the way to the shower. And you should lose, burn enough calories to lose an ounce a month, for Christ's sake. 
but he still loves doing it. So it's not dead to him. Ever think that life is going too fast? Get on the treadmill for 40 minutes and just life comes to a stop, doesn't it? You're on there, <laughs> sweaty, tired, and I go over and get on the scale. This is absolutely true. I was like half a pound heavier. I was half a, I worked out for 40 minutes and I got on the scale and I thought, well, maybe do I have a sweat? No, I don't have a thing on me. Oh, and I thought, oh, I'm all sweaty. That weighs, no, that came out of me, all right. <laughs> And I finally figured it out. It took a while. You know what I figured it out? It's very simple. It was simply the six ounces. It was just the weight of the disappointment pushing down. Oh my God. Failure weighs more than muscle. I don't know if you know that. So that's what it was. I think comics are like blues musicians. We get better as we get older because we learn more tricks. We're much more confident. I have a big germ phobia. Every night I'm meeting comics and shaking hands. I was getting like two colds a month, so that's when I stopped shaking hands and I started arming myself with wet naps. I love Larry. Isn't he weird? He's a weird guy. I don't know what the word is, but he's kind of germophobic. He doesn't like to shake hands, doesn't like to hug, really. And, um, but he likes to uh, give tongue. I don't know what's the expression. I'm very seductive around women. Look at this. Yeah. I noticed that. He's got me. He's I walk got... in, take him. Yeah, yeah. Like a loney. Gonna hit you like a slide trombone. I told him my name is... That's uh, Larry Bubbles Brown who's just tagging along tonight. Uh, he just comes here, he eats whatever food there is in the green room, and he says, has these sort of disgusting Tourette syndrome rhymes that he says to women, like, Cindy, I'm gonna do it to you when it's windy, and then he leaves. <laughs> The rhyme Sam woman's Barney's name is very seductive. Yeah. <laughs> I told you. My last name is Orange. Orange. Like most men, I'm obsessed with women. And how long have you known Larry Bubbles Brown? <laughs> it's been seven magical months. And do you know anything about the comedy scene of the uh, 80s in San Francisco? That my mom banged a lot of those com comedians. Nice. <laughs> did, did, she, did she bang me? Maybe. Uh, this could maybe, be your dog. maybe I'm your father, <laughs> but uh, I just kind of I flirt with them. But if they if they flirt back, I run the other way. So I'm I'm kind of like a creepy uncle. I'm totally harmless. He always had to do that thing of some you know underage girl would come up going, "That's the man." My worst fear about Larry is that he'll uh, not make any money in the future, and he'll ask to move in with me. Yeah, that would be very bad. Larry's performing at the Throckmorton in Mill Valley, and I brought my son, Cody, who at the time I think was 17 or maybe, maybe 16. Yeah, my friend got wholesome Viagra. He goes, hey, you want to try this? Yeah, give me Viagra's like giving a homeless man a doorbell. <laughs> and he knocked Cody out, and Cody's a pretty tough audience. When I went and did Letterman kind of shortly after that, I said, you know, Bub, my son saw Bub, and he said he was amazing. And I think if, 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 if he can win Cody, this is, it's worth giving Bubbles a shot. Larry Bubbles Brown. Larry, come on out and... <laughs> well, calm down, Mr. Fun's here. I know what you're all thinking. Looks like Rain Man and E.T. had a baby. <laughs> Boy, it just keeps getting better. Someone stole my identity. Now he has no life. <laughs> Wouldn't it be neat if you knew what day you were going to die, but not the year? Politics, man, I finally figured politics out. An oil man became president, an oil man, and gas went to four fifty a gallon. Yeah. I hope we never elect a pimp. <laughs> you guys have been great, thank you. I hold the record for the longest time between appearances on The Letterman Show by a comic, 21 years. I'm like a locust. Every 21 years I crash that show. I am actually 
This is weird because I'm such a, I don't think I'm a cynic, I'm a skeptic, but I am optimistic for the first time in several years, actually. <laughs> I'm splitting semantic hairs, but uh, I'm optimistic for the first time in years. I mean, you know what? I have a friend who's like a business guy, and he's like, you know why businesses fail? And this is always my answer, because I'm an idiot. Um, Because they don't make any money? Well, yes, but you know why they don't make money, continue to make money? They don't continue to make money because they don't realize the rules of the game have changed. If the game has changed, they're still trying to sell typewriters. They have the best typewriter shop, but they don't understand the rules have changed. Sort of, now I've realized that, that I'm still selling buggy <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Political uh, comedy. When they know, can get it on TV for free, you know, they can I've get it. I've got a VCR repair shop. It's boomers. <laughs> on fire. Beta. Larry, Beta. When, when the tape comes out of your A-track, Larry can get it back in there. It's a dollar a tape. The social media has changed everything. You can access a lot of people really fast. And so I'm thinking of this idea of pop-up comedy. Why do I have to go to a comedy club or even a big theater? I can take any small space, a conference room for that matter, tell all of my friends and have, you know, 80 people pop in, 100 people pop in a night, just do my own pop-up right now comedy show anywhere. If I've learned anything in this business, it's that, you know, you're not going to be snagged out by the comedy gods and taken to comedy success land. You're going to have to create your own thing. You're going to have to separate yourself from the pack. And, you know, maybe a 60-seat room in Berkeley isn't exactly um, you know, the fast track to fame and riches and success, but it is certainly going to separate me from the pack, I mean, and not have to go to chuckle huts. But the problem is people are now saying, hey, do you want a gig in April or March for like $750 on Saturday night or whatever amount of money on Saturday night? Well, I can go here and make a f nothing. On the other hand, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. What says you? I mean, isn't that the whole reason that you're doing it? Because you don't want to do crappy gigs anymore? Mm -hmm. So commit and then make it happen. Yeah, Just be brave and be broke for a while. One man show. It's called Elect to Laugh. They're listening to the words. They are yours for that 90 minutes. At a theater, people who come there read or know someone who does. It's just me. If they don't get it, it's my fault. That's like getting called from my, by a hot chick. Uh, you know, you're sitting there really depressed, there's no work in the books, and then Dana emails you, hey, you want to do these gigs with me? No, my God, you just realize, hey, now I can pay my health insurance. Feel like you're in show business. I'm driving Dana Carvey and Larry Brown to a, uh, a series of uh, one-night gigs. I find that comedians in the car tend to coalesce around the same ideas. John Wayne would have been a great pope. <laughs> I said, get on your knees and pray to him. <laughs> but I'm an atheist, Duke. I said, get on your knees. I'm giving you communion, but I ate Duke. I said, I'm sticking bread in your mouth and giving you wine. You'll have your communion, all right. <laughs> Funny. John Wayne is the Pope. That's the funny. angriest Pope in history. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just ordering faith. Just faith. You'll have faith, all right. Now, I told you to believe and you'll believe. Duke, I'm agnostic. I got questions. I said believe. <laughs> Never wavers. <laughs> he just threatens to shoot anyone who, who mildly questions him. Talk to my attorney, Smith and West. <laughs> <laughs> so right now you have to. We have to get um, figure out what this show is. And um, right. my question for you is, what do you? You have a theater. You've always wanted. Nobody's in front of you. There's no bad comic in front of you. 
So <laughs> we, the lights go down. I like philosophical. Everyone is turning things. off their cell phone. Now what happens? Uh, that's a good question, but I have a full 24 hours to do it. Well, basically, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go down the list of this. So you're just going to walk on. You're going to go, hi, yeah. Vegas. That's a hell of a place. I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to do that, which is more stand-up-y, or whether I'm going to march right out and say something like, uh, you know. I first started comedy in the mid-'80s when I was in graduate school in San Diego. So oh. you're suggesting that you maybe are going to do some kind of, kind of my life thing? Like, I was... Born a young man? Yeah, but the problem with that is if you open with something when I was born a young man, the problem with that is then that sort of sets the tone for the show and what are you doing? Well, if you come out and you say, when I was eight, my father fell down right a flight now. of stairs yeah. into a vat of whiskey. Okay, so the lights um, go down, they say. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to. Maybe the lights don't go down. Okay, don't when know. will you know? <laughs> When the lights go down. I see. No, if the show is going to be irreverent and political, I might come right out and say... If it is. If it is. Uh -huh. I, mean, I mean, there's two ways of doing that. One is to say, America's a great country, isn't it? It's kind of wacky how people... And that's one show, and then the other show is... I'm not asking case. you what you could possibly do. I'm asking you what you're going to do. So now it's... Well... Okay, ding, 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 now's the time. You're asking me what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a thing I think is going to work in that room and show me what that room can do or can't do. And Which I think, is? Um, I don't know. I don't know at this very minute. Uh, sometimes what I need to do is get up and do 10 push-ups and five jumping jacks and walk around the room and get a cup of tea and come back. And then these words that are going like this now somehow right. come a little more clear. Well, um, maybe this whole thing isn't for you. I mean, you're always desperate to well, get out of these uh, uh, nacho barns, as you're calling well, them. But I'll, I'll, um, I don't think you need to do it if it makes you unhappy. I'm nervous about everything. It's a funny thing. This is what I want in some weird way, yet for the entire week before, I'm like, what was I thinking? We're in Grass Valley, Bedford, Oregon, Redding, and now Modesto. I got more crow's feet than a scarecrow after a cold front. <laughs> Larry reminds you, Carmi doesn't get much better than this. <laughs> Everywhere he goes, I can live here. And he looks in his hotel room, he's got a shower. I mean, he has never lost that thread, so it's really uplifting to be around. The best thing is, it just, uh, he always tells me, uh, he always tells me, get the salmon, because we're kind of health conscious. That and the free shampoos. Larry's maybe the funniest, he might be the funniest of all of us, oh. possibly. I'm nervous, that's funny. What's the worst thing that happened? You get to do a taste I got the I got the easy job. I'm doing 15. Dana's doing... Imagine you were headlining the Indian Casino in Northern California. What you'd be thinking? Oh, I was, I was freaking going over my notes. And can I do 45? We ready? Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Hey. Um, thank you. I'll see you out there on the ice. Okay. This, holy <laughs> Should have been going over my notes. God. sometime talk show host, writer, humorist, political satirist, and all-around loud mouth commentator, Mr. Johnny Steele. show the last comic standing he's a funny funny guy so welcome Larry Bubbles Brown enjoy wow. your night thank you keep, keep it going for Lynn wow a lot of good-looking women here tonight uh, it's your lucky night ladies I'm no longer infected so I love watching the audience gradually um, really get involved in him as he goes along, they really start to trust him and like him. And he's doing stuff that's sexual by nature, but it never comes off biting, you know? And it's all, the joke's all about him. <laughs> he really knows what he's doing. If you're young, enjoy your youth. So I'm getting to that age where I'm starting to get health issues. I found a small lump on my testicle. My doctor goes, you idiot, that is your testicle. <laughs> 
Then he says, I need a list of all the women you've had sex with recently. I'm thinking, oh, do I have a disease? He goes, no, but if you get them in a bed, I know I can. <laughs> You're going to love them. Uh, comedy legend, Saturday Night Live, Wayne's World, HBO Special. Give it up to my good friend, Mr. Dana Carvey. Ah. It's a quantum leap from middle to headliner. It's kind of from having fun to like, okay. <laughs> hey, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I, this is a tractor pull, this is hard work. You feel like a responsibility if you're the headliner. This brings us to Larry. Could be a headliner, but meh. I think it's brilliant. I think it's like, it's, he's more self-actualized than Oprah. I mean, if you understand your nature and sort of apply that to your lifestyle, with no apologies, it's a very healthy thing to do. I smoke and I drink and I eat red meats and I know I know I'm a bad, bad man. But I'm not stupid. I'm down to six or seven cigarettes a day, mostly because I live in San Francisco. <laughs> Is that a cigarette? No, it's a joint. Well, it better be. Joint. <laughs> For Christ's sake, what are they gonna do? Come and throw you into imaginary jail? <laughs> and all you non-smokers are hap hap happy now, aren't you, you smug little misses? <laughs> well, you think about it. You get the government involved in healthcare, they're not gonna stop with cigarettes. Uh-uh, no sir, it's a camel's nose under the tent. It's a slippery slope. You know what's next? It's so obvious. Bacon. <laughs> and then blue cheese. It's aromatically aggressive. I refuse to be forced to sit next to you and abide your secondhand cheese. Until finally, chocolate. <laughs> Suddenly, it's a room full of grassroots First Amendment activists. <laughs> we would go on a vacation every year to Santa Cruz. I just remember it took like nine hours to get there because someone had to go to the bathroom all the time. And this was before freeways, and there was all these two lane roads. And they always had like names like Blood Alley and Dead Man's Curve. That's for real, right? Because in the summer, everyone, and this was before Mothers Against Drunk Driving, people hanging out the window. And there were, I remember there was a wreck every time. Don't look, don't look. Well, don't look. We're in the back. It's like, good guy on the side of the Happy vacation. Yeah, my eyeball out. Woo, vacation. When I'm doing stand-up, I feel totally at peace. A solo show, this is petrifying. What do I have for these people? What am I gonna do? I'm just trying to be comfortable with the fact, be in the moment, perform for the people who came tonight, make them laugh. And so every summer, my poor wife, we go back there, and she's like, what are we doing here? And we go to that spot. And as a 52-year-old man, I stand on that spot, and I close my eyes, and I could smell the grease on the track. You smell the grease, and you could smell the electricity from the different rides, and I could hear the birds chirping and the waves and the roller coaster going. And just for like 10 seconds, I'm seven or eight years old again, and the greatest vacation of my life is about to unfold in front of me. I don't have an ounce of cynicism. And if I can capture that for just a moment, I would be so happy. But Tonight, you guys have been very nice and brought me somewhere close to that. And thank you very much for coming down to my little showroom here. Thank you. When it works, when it works. And the best part, when it works. <sighs> you can have that audience and you can be working them and every syllable, every gesture, precision and syncopated and the crowd is with you all the way and you get off stage and the next voice you hear is the waitress behind you and you're mortal again but for that moment you were you were surfing across the clouds so life is a couple of moments that's all nothing wrong with that
<laughs> Get out of here. Thank you. Thank you. They treat you good here in show business. Honey roasted, that sounds good. The ideal job would be if Dana would go out and do 300 gigs a year, and give me about 150 of them. <laughs> that would be perfect. So let's see if we can talk him into that later. Have we gone over my worst fear, germs? Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. Thank you, Hanson. Hanson. Larry. 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 Uh, he's got his oh, virtual, he's got his virtual yeah. yeah. This is a yeah, POV yeah. right. shot right here. You ready? I'm sorry. Yeah. Who's got it better than us? Everybody! As I get older, I realize, oh, we all share so many of the same struggles. And oh, look, if you make jokes about them, right, it makes it less painful for people. And then you find out you're not the only one. And that makes that reduces the pain by at least 50%. And what a treasure to be in that position. It's a gift. There'll be nights where it doesn't go so well, and you go, maybe I shouldn't do this. And But then it, the courage is to keep doing it. And we're all still standing. That means you, you made your living off talking into a metal thing on a platform at night, and that's pretty miraculous. Yeah. You could speckle your career with some television shows, or some movies, or some this, or some that. And none of it would ever be as great as being able to go and stand in front of a group of people that, that came out for the purposes of laughing for the night and, and, uh, and tell them jokes and hear their laughter. Um, there is no better job. And so Johnny Steele and Larry Brown and Will Durst are three of the luckiest guys in the world. There's a cop in my neighborhood in Berkeley who's a fan of mine, and he pulled up one day about a year ago. He goes, Johnny, I won't be seeing the neighborhood anymore. And I said, well, why is that? He said, I'm retiring. I said, wait a minute, what? He said, yeah, I'm like the same age. I'm like, oh my god, what am I going to do? <laughs> Our only option at this point is bank robbery. <laughs> but I have a couple of really good plans. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Want more Truly California? Visit us online to keep up with the local film scene, stream full documentaries, and submit your film to Truly California. Support for Truly California is provided by the members of KQED.